All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me here. I'm just going to wait a few minutes, let people get on. See how things are going. Let's see here. All right. Looks like <clears throat> looks like we're going here. I'm just trying to check and make sure everything is up and running smoothly. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to kind of get started here, um, chat a little bit while some people come in. But uh, first of all, I just want to say that I am still basking in the glow of my Atlanta Braves winning uh, this weekend or this week, uh, winning the World Series. Um, you guys know, you read my newsletters, you know what a, uh, just how much I love the Braves and how my teams never seem to win. So anyway, so nice to actually have a team that won one time and uh, came through for us. So anyway, pretty excited about that. Um, also very excited about uh, the Patriot and uh, how it's going and, uh, you know, the release of this book and everything. So uh, anyway, super, super happy about that and uh, appreciate all you guys uh, for your support and getting out there and, uh, you know, buying this book and reading it and getting great feedback already from readers uh, with this thing. So I'm going to dig in here and I got to say, I'm not, uh, I realized after reading back through it, what a challenge I give uh, some of my narrators, uh, <laughs> it'd be Kyle Tate or Dwight Kuhlman who do these, uh, this series from uh, the, the Brady Hawk world and Titus Black. It's uh, sometimes I don't think about what it would be like to actually have to read this out loud and how much, um, how much I torture these guys. But anyway, uh, I'm going to do my best to read some of these phrases that I wrote here in uh, Russian and other languages um, and uh, see where it goes from here. But just to preface all this, um, the Patriot, um, this is probably one of my favorite uh, Titus Black stories. Took me a, a while to kind of get this one ironed out as far as the plot goes. Um, you know, Titus Black is a fun character. He's, He's relentless. Um, and he, over time, you know, as you've been following the series, he's gotten a little bit more, a little bit more trusting than he used to be of people. And uh, so that kind of serves to be somewhat of a, um, you know, kind of a, a plot point in this story where his trust for people um, ends up, you know, kind of uh, biting him in the end, so to speak, a little bit. So anyway, I don't want to give all that away. If you haven't read it, but it is fun, and um, I'm going to try to read. I I will warn you that I've had a cold, and uh, so my uh, my voice is a little bit. It's not as great as it. Or it's not as uh, I don't know. It's not as good as it normally is. So anyway, um, I'm going to begin. I'm going to read the first first two chapters for you guys. And if you've got questions, you want to pop in, drop them in the comments. Um, I will be able to see these and some of them I will uh, respond to if I I'll take a break maybe every now and then um, if you have questions or whatever you can drop something there and uh, in between chapters for sure if you have any questions or comments about the first chapter about the characters or anything else like that drop them there and I'll look at them if not uh, if you're watching this after it's been posted and uh, you just want to see what's going on with it uh, or just watch it um, and you have questions, still drop them there. I will respond to you at some point um, and uh, try to try to catch up on those and answer any questions you might have. So anyway, without any further ado, I'm going to try this. So it'll be fun. Uh, the Patriot. Chapter one. Tigarek, Russia. Sergei Lukin eased to his knees in the dirt as he examined his blossoming crop of bull's heart tomatoes. He ran his fingers along the smooth surface, examining every inch with a satisfied grin. After mopping his brow, he staggered to his feet and glanced up at the sun, 
which was warmer than usual for an early July afternoon. He stepped back and surveyed his tomato plants again. This might be my best crop yet. Sergei shuffled across his garden and up his porch steps. He winced as he grabbed his lower back, the pain resulting from years of hard work as a farmer. For the better part of the past five decades, he'd been the most productive farmer in the hamlet of Tigarek, as well as the entire region. But that wasn't even the achievement that he was most proud of. That was reserved for the patch of land without a single thing growing on it. He whistled for his dog Stalin, who bounded toward him. The chortai skidded to a stop, his long tail whipping back and forth as he stared at his master. Sergei kneeled next to the animal and scratched behind his ears. Want to go for a walk? Stalin panted before darting back and forth in front of Sergei. The old man chuckled at his dog's enthusiasm. You know where we're going, don't you? Sergei asked. Stalin darted down the path leading away from Sergei's house. The dog knew exactly where they were headed. As Sergei walked, he looked skyward in the direction of the sun. The heat wasn't something he was used to, but he didn't mind. He spent more than half the year bundled up, so a little warmth didn't bother him. The recent heat wave had made his joint pain all but disappear. His knees felt great as he plodded through the long grass toward the designated area. Sergei watched as Stalin sprinted back and forth over the area devoid of any growth. After Sergei enjoyed the moment, he shuffled over to a tree and pulled a lever. After a few seconds, the ground trembled as the circular area of dirt began to slide to the side, revealing a deep hole in the ground. Though he'd seen it many times, Sergei always felt a sense of pride as he looked deep into the cavern. Nearly a hundred feet beneath the surface, he spotted the tip of a missile and smiled. Malisichka, he said with a grin. How are you doing down there? Are you ready to destroy some Americans? He nodded as if he understood the hunk of metal situated underneath him. Of course you will, he said. Sergei ambled over toward the pine tree a few feet away and yanked down on the lever. The ground rumbled before the lid swung over the hole and the hydraulics pressed down, closing the open space. He whistled at Stalin, who'd wandered off chasing a butterfly. The dog's head snapped in the direction of his owner before scrambling back toward him. Good boy, Sergei said as he knelt next to the dog. I have a treat for you at the house. Stalin panted, his tongue hanging out as he looked up at Sergei. After surveying the area one final time, Sergei headed back toward his house, a modest one by any standards. It had been where he'd raised his daughter with his wife, who'd recently departed after falling ill with pneumonia. Due to her failing health, he'd wanted to move closer to the Caspian Sea, maybe build a small waterfront home. Such a decision would have benefited Sergei's wife. But he just couldn't uproot everything he'd ever known. And he certainly wasn't about to abandon his post, as outdated as it seemed at the time. The Cold War had ended with the thud of the Iron Curtain collapsing in a heap of rubble in Germany years ago. Soviet states collapsed thereafter and then demanded their freedom. The once great country of the USSR had dissolved into an instant when viewed in light of the history of the world. But Sergei was convinced that dissolution of the USSR was temporary. The world would come to its senses and recognize just how important the Soviet Republic was. It was more than just an ideal to be accepted. It was a way of life. And more than anything, it was Sergei's way of life, although a tenuous one now. Forty-three years had passed since Sergei received his commission and the deed to more than 200 acres of fertile farmland to go along with it. His duties were simple, albeit monotonous. Once a week, he climbed down into the silo that the Soviet military had constructed on his farmland and checked to see if the light was green or red. Then, he reported his findings by calling a hotline. His method of registering what color the light was had changed slightly over the years. At first, he read back a code that was mailed to him each week from Moscow. When he received a push-button phone, he was able to enter a number that corresponded with the colors. One for Zeleny, two for Krasny. The technology had advanced to the point that he merely had to dial the phone number and say the color to the automated voice when prompted. However, none of that changed. The fact that Sergei had to climb down the ladder and climb back up again, something he wasn't sure he could do much longer. Sergei's wife had warned him that he needed to bring up the issue with his contact in Moscow, but she died eight years ago from cancer and wasn't about to yield his duties. His country still needed him, and as far as he knew, the American still posed a threat. As long as he was physically able, Sergei was going to complete his task each week and be proud of the fact that he accomplished it 
as significant as it might seem. Sergei Lukin was a patriot, and he made sure there was never any doubt about the fact that fact either. The bronze bust he fashioned of Nikita Khrushchev spoke volumes about Sergei's allegiance, even if Khrushchev tried to make Joseph Stalin a footnote on the timeline of the Eastern superpower. He stopped on his way back to the house and yanked a couple of bull hearts off the vine before heading inside. When the screen door creaked and then slammed behind him, he placed his new harvest on the kitchen table and then called the number that had been seared into his memory. After a few seconds, a woman answered and requested his password. He dutifully recited it and then delivered his verdict. Zeleny, he said. A high-pitched tone acknowledged his response, and Sergei hung up the phone. He washed his tomatoes and then started slicing them for his dinner. After preparing and eating this food, he had just finished cleaning up when he heard Stalin break into a barking fit on the front porch. The low rumble of a pair of vehicles arrested his attention. Drying his hands on a dish towel, he walked to the front door and peered outside. A pair of SUVs skidded to a stop in his gravel driveway. Privyet, Sergei called with a wave and a grin to his visitors. He was a little taken aback by the surprise visit, but he'd grown accustomed to Russian military officers dropping in unannounced to inspect his Lishitska, his little fox. The man who got out of the front passenger side of the SUV didn't smile or even acknowledge Sergei. He started to hyperventilate as the man stormed toward the house. What is the meaning of this? Sergei asked. The man signaled to the rest of the crew. They hustled out of their vehicles and rushed toward Sergei who didn't move as he covered his head with his hands. What are you doing? he asked. None of the crew replied as they picked him up and carried him into the house. They placed him in a chair at the kitchen table. Hot tears streaked down Sergei's face and splattered on the placemat in front of him. He knew they weren't going to answer his questions, let alone offer up an exclamation that made any sense. Years ago, he'd seen neighbors whisked away without warning, never to return. Years uh, And while the Soviet government no longer existed, the one that took its place in Russia was no different, comprised by the same men from an era long ago. Whatever Sergei had done, or hadn't done, he'd never know. The end would come swift and sudden. The man who'd led the agent swarming into Sergei's house gave a wry grin as he held his weapon against Sergei's temple. Any last words, old man? Dajavrutsyet Matushka Rossiya Rossiya Navsegda. Whatever they thought he'd done, Sergei didn't want to be there to be any doubt that he was a patriot. Long live Mother Russia, Russia forever. That was the last thought he had before his head hit the table, his body limp and lifeless. All right, chapter two. Going on chapter two. You guys have any questions or comments on that? We will get started. All right. <clears throat> Hope you like my Russian accents. Um, been working on those for a while. See if they're any good. All right. Here we go. I think I drink of water here. Okay. Chapter two. Fan Mountains, Tajikistan. Titus Black focused his camera on the landscape in front of him. Craggy peaks towered over the emerald waters of Lake Mijon, a scene teeming with natural beauty. But as much as Black enjoyed drinking in such scenes, he wasn't focused on the mountains or the lake. He was looking for his target. Are you sure he's here? Black asked over his comms. Christina Shields, his partner, observing the events from the comfort of her headquarters in, in Washington, D.C., sighed. What is he doing? He was there two minutes ago. So, you don't see him anymore either? Black asked. Maybe he ran into a cave, but I can't tell. The sun isn't doing me any favors either. All the long shadows are making this very difficult. Drop Black, Black dropped his lens and scanned the horizon. Daylight trickled away, leaving Black with no more than a half hour before he'd have to continue his search in the dark. He raised up his lens once more to focus on the area where his target had last been seen. Anything? She asked. Not yet, Black said. Wait a minute. What is it? I saw some movement up on the ridge. I... I saw some movement up on the ridge. I think that might be him. Are you sure? It's near the location you gave me that you last had for him. Good, she said. He sure is a slippery one, Black chuckled. It's why he's still alive. Black secured his camera in his bag before striking off for the top of the ridge. If he hustled, he figured he could make it there in 15 minutes. 
When Black joined Firestorm, he had no idea that extractions would become such a regular part of his workload. He'd signed up for the killing terrorist masterminds and eliminating dangerous threats to the U.S., both on foreign soil and at home. But he'd done more than his fair share of assisting other agents trapped behind enemy lines. Technically, James Lloyd wasn't trapped. But Tajikistan's diplomatic relationship with the U.S. was tenuous, especially when the small Central Asian country was forced to choose between the Americans and one of its next-door neighbors, the Chinese. For over a week, Lloyd had been trying to escape from China after serving as a spy there for over six years. A trusted liaison informed the secret police of Lloyd's true purpose for being in the country, forcing him to flee. He'd barely evaded the authorities in a wild chase across town before heading to the wilderness and scrambling across the border into Tajikistan. Extracting him from Afghanistan would have been easier logistically, but the Taliban's presence in the northeast part of the country made it nothing short of a suicide run. And while every government agency wanted to glean Chinese secrets from Lloyd, no one was willing to risk the political fallout of rescuing him. Hence, the job fell onto Firestorm's shoulders, and more specifically, Titus Black's. Black clambered up the rugged hillside, which was nothing short of a geologist's paradise. Glacial scarring marked much of the steep mountains. Snow topped the highest peaks as the wind howled through the corridor, cut over time by a relentless assault from Mother Nature. Black paused and took out his camera to zoom in on Lloyd's position. You still have eyes on him? Shields asked. Because I can't find him. Checking now, Black said. He was crouched behind a boulder, probably to get out of this wind. And now? I can't see any sign of him, Black said. Before, I could at least see his backpack. Are you sure he knows what this is? What? Are you sure he knows this is the extraction point? That's what I was told but I guess we can't be certain until I see him. Black scrambled on top of a plateau before scoping out the location again through his camera. Still no sign of him, he said. I might know why, Shields said. Don't keep me in suspense. Check your six. Black turned around and saw a group of men riding on horses, storming toward his position. He used his camera to get a closer look and noticed they were all carrying weapons. One of it, the men raised his rifle and aimed it at Black. He cursed as he packed up his camera and sprinted toward the next rise. You think you can make that? Shields asked. Do I have any other options at this point? He fired back. Because if you're seeing something I don't, I'd love to hear about it. Black kept running, his eyes fixed on the border, a boulder where he'd last seen Lloyd. I wish I had something for you, she said. But from the looks of things, I think you need to shoot your way out of this one. I didn't bring that much ammo. You're in the perilous mountains of Tajikistan. If you don't cross paths with wild boars or bears up there, you're bound to run across marauders, and all those threats require you to be armed to the teeth if you want to live. I also had to backpack in here, Black said. You have a point, she said, but you've also got me in a predicament. You're in a predicament, she sighed. Look, the last thing we need right now is a game of one-upping each other. Agreed. Now, what I meant was, I can't ask the expedition company I hired to do the extraction to bring its helicopter into a region where there's an active gunfight, she said. That'd be unfair to the company as well as unfair to you. If they somehow were to take down the chopper... I get it, Black said. You'd be jeopardizing more our lives to save ours, yet we would all end up dead anyway. I understand. I just don't see any other way at this point. Be resourceful, she said. I've seen you do it many times before. Black reached a steep part of the ledge and jumped high on the wall for a good handhold. He heard bullets start to ping off the rocks around him. Lloyd, Black called as he worked his way up the wall. Lloyd, this is Titus Black. I'm part of the extraction team to get you out of this hell hole. There was no response. Lloyd, are you up there? Black asked again. Moments later, he reached the top and pulled himself onto the level ground. Then he sprinted toward the boulder and checked behind it. As he did, someone grabbed him from behind, thrusting him against the rock. Black didn't look at the man's face. Instead, his attention was arrested by the knife in his hand. When Black finally locked eyes with the man, he lowered his weapon and then gave him a relaxed smile. I was wondering if they were going to send someone to get me out of this nightmare, or if they were just going to send someone to kill me, Lloyd said. Black nodded and returned the smile. (laughs) Well, they didn't just need to send anyone, because there are plenty of people already trying to do that. Take a peek around this rock. Lloyd eased around the edge before darting back. Who's that? Hell if I know, Black said. Probably just some locals trying to rob us blind. Lloyd rubbed his goatee and nodded. Black rummaged through his pack as Lloyd peppered his rescuer with questions. So, where's the rest of the extraction team? Black shrugged. 
What do you mean? I'm it. Just me. My partner in Washington observing everything over satellite. And some dude we played triple his rate to fly us out of here on an expedition chopper. That's it? Lloyd asked as his eyes widened. More than enough experience to get you out of here safely, Black said. Now, you want to stop your moaning and help me get us out of here? Lloyd didn't move. His eyes locked on the men thundering toward them. Those people will be able to get us. Get up here. Trust me. And that's why I don't want to be around to see it, Black said. Now, would you focus and help me out here? Lloyd nodded. Got a weapon for me? Lloyd pulled out the gun he'd tucked in the back of his belt and tossed it to him. You can use this, but I don't intend on fighting from here. What do you mean? Lloyd asked. This is the high ground. This is the best place to fight from. Not for me, Black said as he dumped a piece of thick square plastic onto the ground. Are you insane? Black nodded. Certifiably. At least that's what I've been told. He fiddled with the valve on the side of the plastic before it started to inflate. Seconds later, they had a boat. Are you out of your mind? If you want to stay up here and fight these guys off one by one, be my guest, Black said. But I don't have time and I don't have time or enough ammo or patience to engage in that kind of warfare. Now, if you want to come with me, I suggest you hop in. Hop in? Black nodded. There's a nice strip of ice right here that will get us down to the lake. And then what? We get to the other side and pick them off one by one, Black said. Lloyd scouted and shrugged. I guess it could work. Why don't you help me find out, Black said, gesturing to the boat. Lloyd climbed in and Black got behind the boat and pushed, shoving the inflatable vessel down a patch of ice that ran almost all the way to the water. They skidded to a stop on the rocky shoreline before carrying the boat to the lake. Black held up a small port... Pro <laughs> Sorry. Black held a small propulsion device in the water, powering them across the lake. Bullets peppered the water around them. Are you sure this was a good idea? Lloyd asked. No, Black said, but it was our best option. He looked up on the ridge where the gang of horsemen had gathered. They circled up and talked for a moment. Then they began their descent to the shoreline, firing random shots as they did. After a few minutes, Black and Lloyd arrived on the opposite side of the water. They built a small blind and prepared for a fight. Black assembled his sniper weapon while Lloyd looked on. How many rounds do you have? He asked. Not many, Black asked. But I'm hoping it's enough. Black heard chuckling in his ear. You find something amusing? Black asked over his comms. Now is about the time you wish that you had your sharpshooter with you, Shields said. Lloyd furrowed his brow. What? My partner providing support, Black whispered. She thinks she's a better shot than me. I heard that, Shields said. You better tell him it's a settled fact, not something I just think. All right, Black said. I'll tell him, but I'm dark for now so I can concentrate. Agent Black, are you? Black cut the feed. Sounds like she was upset about something, Lloyd said with a grin. She'll get over it. She just needs a minute. Black eased into a prone position behind the blind and started to sight in the arriving horsemen. Something's not right, Lloyd said. What do you mean? They're not all here, Lloyd explained. I see only about half the men. Where are the others? Black sat up and turned around, only to notice the sun glinting off an object on the ridge behind him. Look out, Black said as he grabbed Lloyd and rolled to the side. Bullets started raining down on them. They scrambled toward another boulder, but exposed themselves to the men across the lake. How good is your aim? Black asked. With this thing? Lloyd said. I guess we're about to find out. See if you can give me some cover to take the, out the men on the other side of the shore. And then we'll start picking these off guys off behind us. Sound like a plan? Let's do it, Lloyd said. Black rolled over and sighted the first man still sitting on his horse. After taking a deep breath, Black pumped two rounds into his target, who clutched his chest before falling onto the ground. The other two men scrambled off their horses and tried to run for cover. Black hit one of the men in the leg before following up with two shots in the chest, leaving just one more man. How's it going? Lloyd asked. Two down, one to go, Black said. Lloyd fired a couple of shots. Uh, I've only got a couple of shots left, so if you could hurry it up, that'd be great. No problemo, amigo. Black watched the man darting around the shore, searching for a place to take cover. As he did, he tripped. When he tried to get up, Black hit the man with a shot to the back of the head. Then Black spun around to take aim at the men flanking him on the ridge. The first two men came down easy, toppling over the edge. He turned on his comms. Shields, it's time for the chopper, Black said. I still see one more active shooter, she said. Though if I were there, we both know there wouldn't be any left at this point. Seconds later, the return fire stopped. Uh-oh, Shields said. I don't like the sound of that, Black said. What is it? The shooter's gone. 
Gone? I don't know, she said. It's just like he vanished into thin air. A bullet whistled just past Black's ear, this time coming from someone on the ground. He and Lloyd crawled behind the boulder, putting it between them and the final target. How'd that happen? Lloyd asked. Beats me, but we need to take him out. I'm out, Lloyd said, shaking his weapon. Black checked his gun. I've only got three more shots left. And what about him? Black turned and emptied all the rounds he had left. The man twisted and turned, dipping and diving like a June bug skimming across the water. Black couldn't get a bead on him before running out of bullets. When Black tried to shoot, but nothing came out except the sickening sound of a mechanical click. The man stopped and laughed. He whipped out a pair of daggers and laughed before charging them. Black grabbed an oar and prepared for battle. Lloyd, however, had a big smile on his face. What? Black asked. I found another bullet, Lloyd said before sliding it into the chamber. He took aim at the oncoming man, hitting him in the chest. The man staggered for a few feet before collapsing onto the ground. Nice work, Black said. The chopper will arrive on the north end of the lake in three minutes, Shields said. The two men scurried around, collecting everything from Black's bag and stuffing it inside it. Then they raced toward the designated pickup location. You must have some important secrets, Black said once they stopped. Lloyd shrugged. I'm just glad you're coming to save me and not kill me. What do you mean? The things I know make me a very dangerous man, the kind that people want dead. The Chinese won't be able to touch you once we get you home. Lloyd shook his head. It's not the Chinese I'm worried about. Americans? Black asked. You ever heard of the Full Good Initiative? Black nodded. Sounds like we need to talk. The helicopter rotors thrummed in the distance as the aircraft descended about 100 meters away. The men put their heads down and hustled to the open door. Good work, Shields said. Keep an eye out for Lloyd, Black said. I think he might be able to help us. Well, it'll have to wait, Shields said. Blunt told me this morning that he's got a new priority mission for us. More priority than the Full Good Initiative? Black asked. Yeah, Shields said. A much bigger priority. All right. That is the end of chapter two. <clears throat> Hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun um, being able to uh, read that for you guys and uh, go through it. It is, um, I'm very thankful for Dwight and Kyle, the two guys that read that professionally. I am, I am not quite trained or good enough to be doing that uh, as a full-time job, but uh, it's fun. It's fun to do it every once in a while and uh, hope you enjoy hearing it in my voice and um, hearing how I, you know, like to, uh, imagine the characters, at least for myself. But those guys do a much better job than me. So uh, I'll be looking forward to uh, the Patriot coming out in Kyle's voice here sometime in 2022. Uh, is that book's um, going to be coming out then? Right now, I think Kyle is working on uh, Blowback, I believe. Um, and it should have that one out very soon. So, and then also, as far as audiobooks go, if you do like them uh, better, because some people do it. Uh, they do like to listen better than read it themselves is um the uh let's see the shadow hunter is finished and will should be up for sale by the end of the month at the very latest so anyway working on that but uh that's what's going on <clears throat> hope you enjoyed uh hope you enjoyed this time and if you have any questions or anything uh feel free to drop the comments there and uh i will look forward to seeing you guys on here again very soon so have a great rest of your Thursday, and I will talk to you later.